this study was evaluating a fundamentally new approach to cancer screening. And it was exploring using blood tests to screen for multiple cancers at once. That's really a paradigm shift in the current approach for cancer screening. The goal was to really understand how patients and physicians would cope with this, particularly receiving a blood test that suggested a cancer might be present, and to understand the diagnostic evaluations that would ensue. So that was the purpose. This was a cohort study. So over 6,000 adults, all over the age of 50, were approached and invited to participate. Adults could participate if they were over 50 with no special risk factors. They could also participate if they fell into a high-risk group, and the high-risk group had a history of smoking or a family history, or themselves had a personal history of cancer and were survivors and had, had survived more than three years cancer-free. So a high-risk group and average ordinary adults over 50 who were receiving their medical care in one of seven U.S. healthcare systems distributed widely across the United States. People who were invited to participate came to see their doctor. They had this blood test. They signed informed consent. It was a research test. They gave a blood specimen. And two weeks later, the patient's physician received a report that said signal was detected or signal was not detected. If signal was not detected, nothing further. There was no further interaction. But at the end of a year, those patients' records were examined to see if cancer was found. For the small proportion of individuals who had a cancer signal detected, this was 1.4% of the population, or 92 individuals. The focus was on them to understand the diagnostic odysseys that would ensue. For these 92 individuals, Two, it turned out upon further questioning, had suspicion of cancer or were undergoing a workup for cancer that started even before they got the test result. And those two were put aside to be quite conservative. Of the remaining 90, the diagnostic evaluations detected cancers in 35 individuals. The remaining individuals, so 55, no cancer was identified despite a diagnostic evaluation. We really wanted to understand what those diagnostic evaluations would entail. And the key, I believe not a surprise, was imaging. Most of these patients had imaging studies, typically CT scans, PET CT scans. But what was valuable about the test is in addition to simply indicating positive signal or negative signal, the test provided suggestions as to the site of origin. So it provided two suggestions, first or second. And in nearly 90% of cases, those signal detections were um, accurate. So for example, there's a signal suggestive of lymphoma. There's a signal suggestive of breast cancer. There's a signal suggested of lung cancer. This helped direct the physician to organize the evaluation. If it was signal detected, head and neck cancer, then of course one could start with an oral pharyngeal examination, for example, by an ENT. So uh, these diagnostic odysseys uh, typically took less than three months. The median was 79 days for everyone. Of course, shorter for the true positive, for the 35 individuals for whom cancer was found, than for the individuals who were false positive. All types of cancers, and that's the powerful thing. The cancers of the 35 cancers, it was split nearly down the middle, 17 versus 18. Solid tumor malignancies, so those are cancers like breast, lung, colorectal, but also 
cancers for which there is no screening, cholangiocarcinoma, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, head and neck cancer, pancreas cancer. That was about half. And the other half was cancers of hematologic origin. And the most common there was lymphoma, some unusual types of leukemia, but quite a few lymphomas as well were detected. And it is important to note there is no standard screening test for lymphoma. The assay looks at uh, methylation and very small bits of abnormal DNA that are shed into the bloodstream. So um, this particular test was, this particular study was intended to really understand how patients and physicians would respond to receiving a positive screening test. But what's really exciting is that this test has already been used in 140,000 adults who receive their care from the UK's National Health Service. And a randomized trial has completed enrollment. 70,000 individuals had the test and 70,000 completed routine care, routine screening, which of course does not extend to most types of cancers. And in a couple of years, we should have results of that study and that will really look at the clinical utility of this test. But I think the current test, the Pathfinder test, does provide a glimpse of what the future may hold, which is a fundamentally new approach to how we think about cancer screening and if you will, a one-stop shopping to screen for lymphoma and uterine cancer and head and neck cancer all at once. I think we're still a ways away. It is absolutely premature to discontinue the routine cancer screenings that we know save lives. I think it's critical to point out that there are some parts of the world where the most important thing that we can do is ensure that people have access to mammography, to colorectal cancer screening, because in many parts of the world, organized screening programs are not fully implemented, even though the technology exists. So we're not ready to abandon what we know works today. But in the future, uh, this um, approach could be a very powerful alternative. There is much discussion about the potential for overdiagnosis and identifying cancers that are not meaningful, cancers that will never hurt an individual in their lifetime. Prostate cancer is perhaps cancers that we don't want to even know about. We don't want to diagnose these cancers. So I think the key with this technology will be thoughtful deployment. Uh, you know, an individual who is 92 years old who would not accept cancer treatment and would not want to, is obviously not going to be a good candidate uh, for this test. Um, again, you know, age is, is, is not a perfect arbiter of anything, uh, of course, but one has to use this technology thoughtfully, and the issues of overdiagnosis are very real and an important concern, um, and there's lots more to learn. But I do think that in the future, the problem of some of the cancers that we have not been able to screen for in an organized way, this, this is very powerful. Cost-effectiveness analysis in this space certainly needs to be done. I think cost-effectiveness analysis requires modeling, and we need more data to inform the models. We're not ready to do the cost-effectiveness analyses until we have more data. But when people succumb to late-stage cancers early and die, it doesn't cost very much because they die quickly of late-stage cancers, but we're not improving extending lives. So the key is to look not only at the cost, but at cost in relationship to life year saves. And the critical issue about all cancer screening is that we need to understand the effects on mortality not simply diagnoses, but mortality. And as we have these data, cost, effective mo cost effectiveness models will be performed that will help inform different countries' organized screening programs as to um, when and whether adoption of this test 
uh, makes sense with respect to the amount uh, of resources that the country has to spend on, on health care. We're a long ways away from that at this point, but I think we can glimpse, um, it's, it provides a tantalizing glimpse uh, of the future.